Good evening and welcome to a special In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. I'm Eric Marsh, Executive Director of WCTV. Glad you're able to join us for this special In Focus program that's becoming a norm for us, special In Focus. Last week we had the uh, state legislators on a special Friday during the day In Focus and this week we have Mayor Snow back with us. Now he has been here on a few occasions and he finally figured out a way to get out of here in less than 90 minutes. Don't let me ask him questions. He's just going to, to deliver the State of the City Address, and we appreciate him using the WCTV studios to be able to bring you this information. Uh, a couple of things I do want to mention. I want to first preface next week's show. Um, whether you're aware of it or not, there's going to be a fair amount of construction going on in this area during this year. They've already started working on some of the streets and roads. Um, that will continue. So we have three folks coming with us next Thursday night at 6 o'clock. Greg Steens from the City of Richmond, their engineer, uh, Bob Warner, Wayne County engineer, and Nathan Riggs from NDOT will be here for an hour to talk about um, one of the two seasons, summer and, you know, construction season. And normally we're used to it out on the expressways, but that construction is going to take place actually in town a great deal. So the 20th Street Bridge, which actually was supposed to close yesterday, has been postponed. That will be closed on Monday, and there'll be a lot of other construction in various places around town, more than we're used to in the city. So. Um, that's something we're going to talk to them about next Thursday. Also want to remind you that our fourth annual fundraiser, 21 for Fun, is coming up. We told you a few weeks ago to save a date. We need, you to tell you, we need to tell you to save a different date. We've moved that event. It is going to be Saturday, June 17th from 7 to 11, and we are going to keep it in the Student Events and Activities Center here on the IU East campus. And if you're not familiar with 21 for Fun, it's a great way to come out, have some fun, craps, blackjack, some roulette. If you're a hardcore gambler, you won't like it because this is truly all for fun. If you just don't like to gamble or have never played these games, the dealers will teach you how to play. So mark the date and save it on your calendar, Saturday, June 17th. Um, on this particular In Focus, as I mentioned, we are going to get the State of the City address. So I'm very pleased to turn this show over to our Mayor, Dave Snow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good evening to all of you, and I want to thank those of you who are in attendance tonight and those of you who are taking the time to tune in. I also want to thank WCTV for hosting this address on a special segment of In Focus, and I'd like to thank our media partners for their live and continued coverage. I want to welcome members of City Council, members of the City Executive Team, members of the Redevelopment Commission, along with former mayors Cliff Dickman and Shelley Miller. Thank you very much for being here. And I also want to welcome all members of the public that are joining us this evening through various broadcasts. I sincerely appreciate those of you who are here tonight and who are tuning in because it is your involvement and your attention to the true state of our city that are key to our success together. Tonight, I have a lot that I want to share with you. Now, I want to be respectful of your time, and I know tonight's a work and a school night, so I will move through these topics fairly swiftly. However, I will be making myself available at several stops around the city to speak about this address, and I will also always have my door open to any member of this community who wants to meet with me face to face. I also hope that this address will inspire conversations around the city, so I encourage you to share what you hear tonight on social media, with your friends, with your coworkers, and with your family. Addressing the overall state of our city means taking the good and the bad. It means taking a hard look at some of the issues that we are currently facing, and it means not only discussing the obstacles in our way, but also discussing the ways that we can work together to find solutions to overcome those obstacles and move forward together as a community. Richmond is a city with an amazing and intricate history, a vibrant and growing quality of life, and a community with a boisterous and passionate spirit. But most importantly, the thing that makes Richmond unique is that we have a tremendous potential of growth. With our recent economic growth spurt, including Blue Buffalo and Omen Casting, the many local organizations whose focus is to help those struggling in our city, and the recent expansion and interest in locally owned businesses, it is clear that Richmond is on the verge of its next great renaissance. These recent successes were not simply the result of overnight good fortune. They required planning and cultivating by those who laid the groundwork 
and those who continue that effort every single day. And most importantly, it took the work of people just like all of you who have a passion for Richmond and took an active role in its success. As we begin to see the benefits of that planning and the subsequent successes that it's brought about, the very worst thing that we can do as a community is sit on the sidelines and just hope that everything moves in the right direction. Taking an active role, capitalizing on our forward momentum, and leveraging our positive assets will ensure our future success. Tonight, I'll be discussing not only my role and the role of city government, but I'll be talking a lot about your role as a citizen because it's important to know that we all play a role in our city's future. In the last year, we in the city government worked very hard to ensure that 2016 was another positive step in the rebuilding phase of our community. Priority number one was building a strong team. Our next goal was bringing that team together to refocus the budget process and putting an emphasis on sustainable and incremental growth so that each department can better serve this city. It was during this process that we prioritized parks, streets and sidewalks, public safety, and increased government efficiency. One of those heavily pressed topics of our budget process was our parks department. Working together with newly appointed park superintendent Denise Retz, we were able to put fresh eyes on a series of several problems in our parks. As Richmond suffered through the economic recession, our parks department took a big hit and the public really began to notice the deteriorating condition of our beautiful park system. The health and vitality of our parks is essential to our quality of life and our opportunity for economic growth. So that is why last year, during the budget process, we invested an additional $275,000 to bring our parks back to where our citizens deserve. Thank you. This will bring our parks 2017 working budget to a total of $2.9 million. Now Denise and her parks team work every day to ensure the cleanliness, the upkeep, and the safety of our parks, and parks are gonna continue to be a priority throughout this administration. And if you're as passionate about parks as I am, I can tell you there is always work to be done, and I happen to know <laughs> Denise is always looking for really good volunteers for programming and cleanup, so I encourage you to contact her. Another point of focus was our streets and sidewalks. Now keep in mind, our street department faces a unique challenge of balancing the immediate needs of our citizens in terms of upkeep, but also planning and budgeting for the long-term development of our city roads. And this is no easy task for a department that has no slow season. In the spring and summer, we expect them to work on our streets, <coughs> curbs, and sidewalks. In the fall, we expect them to pick up our leaves. And in the winter, we expect them to salt and plow our roads in a timely manner to keep us safe. They also maintain all of our city-owned trees all throughout the year. Our street commissioner, T.L. Bozell, and his crew do an excellent job of balance, balancing that workload every day. During the budget process, we invested an additional $150,000 into their equipment. That investment, paired with strong long-term planning, served as the keystone in securing the Community Crossings Grant for $948,000. Now that money will primarily be used for the infrastructure upgrade around the industrial park for the Blue Buffalo Project. But what it will do is free up money for eight additional street projects in our city. This will accelerate our long-term street plan so that we can get more done in less time. To relieve the stress that some of the street department puts on our general fund, I'm asking the Redevelopment Commission to fund a piece of much needed equipment. In today's era of government being required to do more with less dollars, this is exactly the kind of outside the box thinking that will help us continue to get work done. Now maintaining our streets and sidewalks is not only an issue of infrastructure and aesthetics, it's also an issue of safety. And our streets and sidewalks can only be considered safe when they are well lit for our citizens. For the past 10 years, there's been a moratorium on new streetlights in our city. In 2016, I began work with City Council's Streetlight Committee. That's Gary Turner, Kelly Cruz Nicholson, and Doug Goss. We set out with two primary objectives. First, to take action. We started by identifying a residential area that had been waiting the longest for streetlights in their neighborhood, and then to budget for their installation in 2017. Our second objective 
was to create a long-term streetlight project list so that we can continue to incrementally, to incrementally adding streetlights all throughout our neighborhoods. Our first area of focus will be a portion of the Oak Park neighborhood, which has been without streetlights for over 10 years. Now this particular streetlight project will go before the Board of Works later this month. And upon their approval, that streetlight moratorium will officially come to an end. We'll continue to plan and budget for lighting projects throughout our city. And our long-term goal is to light all of the neighborhoods and all the streets all throughout Richmond. And this is going to take some time. It's a big goal. But if we keep this up year after year, we'll continue to light up Richmond. Thank you. Now, as we talk about the safety of our city, police and fire take the most significant role in that conversation. In the past, their numbers have been lacking. But for 2017, we were able to add one new firefighter and two new officers to our forces. This is a huge accomplishment for the safety of our city. And I can tell you, that these two departments have never been run so well. In the police department, Chief Jim Branham uses a diverse set of policing methods. One method that he utilizes is community policing, which focuses on connecting our officers to citizens on a more personal level. Through this focus came the creation of the Richmond Police Department Division of Community Engagement, which is why lately you've heard so much about outreach efforts, including coffee with a cop, and why you, why you may have seen officers walking around downtown and in neighborhoods. You can expect to see plenty more of this. Now over in the fire department, Chief Jerry Purcell has taken the training of our firefighters to a new level. He has installed two new state-of-the-art live burning training structures. The first civilian EMT class was completed and a group of firefighters are training to become paramedics. This training, along with upgrades and equipment, have led to an average response time of only three minutes and 23 seconds within our city. It's really quite an accomplishment. When we are talking about medical emergencies, saving those seconds means saving lives. Stronger police presence, excellence in training, faster and more certain response times. This is how we begin to ensure the safety of our community. Chiefs Branham and Purcell, along with all of the brave men and women in these departments, continue to make our city safer each and every day, often at the expense of their own safety. In talking about the budget and the investments that have been made, a lot of the results of that budgeting are very visible to all of us as we travel around the city. However, some of the results of that budgeting are really only visible within the walls of City Hall. I firmly believe that government's wasted time is taxpayers' wasted money. So therefore, we've worked really hard to increase efficiency and communication by combining executive departments, increasing teamwork among departments, and speeding up government timelines. We've strengthened our digital infrastructure and security to protect your data and the data of our employees. And most importantly, we have finally taken the first steps to make certain that we are properly compensating our hardworking city employees. In 2017, this was a huge priority, and we worked really hard through that work to offer a 2% raise to all of our employees, which is the first increase in base salary that they've seen in nearly 10 years. That may only be a small step, thank you. Thank you. That may only be a small step, but it is certainly a step in the right direction. Now, all of these accomplishments were made possible by strong, thoughtful budgeting on the part of city department heads and increased communication between the administration and city council. This relationship, the thoughtful budgeting, the thoughtful discussions, the due diligence, and the ability to find progress through compromise are the engine that powers the wheels of city government. It's often said that there's too much red tape and too much bureaucracy within government and that things move much too slowly. But one of the quickest and most effective ways that we can move faster is to work together. That is what the people of the city deserve, and that is what we will continue to do. The partnerships between the administration and council are paramount to creating an even better community. Now, although we were successful in 2016 at overcoming some of the challenges that were before us, including challenges that we're going to see again year after year, such as controlling health care costs, upgrading our infrastructure, and adequately paying our employees, there are challenges that we still have yet to face. 
One of those challenges that is on the horizon and quickly approaching is our human rights ordinance. This ordinance is the law that establishes protection for people in our community. It currently states that people cannot be discriminated against based on race, gender, ethnicity, or religion. It is an important law that speaks to the very nature of who we are as a community and as a country. However, there is room for growth. That is why this year I'll be bringing an amendment to the ordinance before City Council. This amendment will include sexual orientation, age, and veteran status. Thank you. Because as we write the narrative for Richmond, it's important that we are known as a community that refuses to tolerate discrimination of any kind. To support this ordinance, it's time to revive a group that was established in the late 80s and has recently fallen to the wayside. The Human Rights Commission was created to help support our citizens against discrimination. I've already begun work, and over the next several months, I will continue to take an in-depth look to determine the past successes and shortcomings of this commission. I'm going to find out how other cities our size have handled these efforts, and I'm going to work to reorganize and rebrand the commission to focus on training, education, and mediation in discrimination disputes. And this isn't just something that should be done. This is something that needs to be done. The protection of our citizens speaks volumes to who we are as a community. And it needs to be undeniably clear that Richmond, Indiana is a welcoming and a safe place to call home for everyone. Yeah. Now that speaks to the very heart of our community. Now Richmond isn't what anybody would call a big city. It's also certainly not a small town. Actually, one of the great things about living in a community just this size is getting to know everyone. As a matter of fact, it's one of my very favorite things about calling Richmond my home. Now, I live over on the west side, so I frequently stop in at the Phillips 66 gas station there on West Main. I grab gas, I get a bottle of water, I go in, I talk to Tony. Tony's in there every single time I go in there, and sometimes I think Tony works more hours than I do. I'm also a regular at Radford's. I stop in to get lunch from Jen and Tracy and the crew, and it's no secret that I'm a coffee lover, so I go see Bennett and Corrigan at Roscoe's, and I see how things are going in the depot district. When I need groceries, you'll typically find me at Meyer, talking to Steve, Rex, Angela, or somebody else on the Meyer team. And when I'm downtown, I stop at the Tin Lizzie, and I say hi to Ron and Marlene. The point that I'm making here is that we are a close-knit community. We talk to each other. We get to know each other. I don't know about you, but I take a certain amount of comfort in knowing the people that I see every day around my city. Take just a second to think about the regular places that you stop along your day and how many times you say hi to the people that you've come to know. That is the true definition of community. When you know the people of your community, losing just one of them can have an impact. If one of them passes away, we feel that as a loss. It's a part of our day and one of our connections that is gone forever. Something that hit me very hard back in January was the release of the number of overdose deaths from our community from last year. Just today, I called our county coroner, Ron Stevens, to get an update, and he told me that 2016 saw 54 confirmed deaths related to drug overdose. That is a record number for our community. That is a number that affects each and every one of us. And what is even more devastating is that at this moment right now, we are trending to break that record for 2017. It is time for all of us to understand that this is a weight that we bear together and we must all play an active role in the solution. I'm going to be very honest with you. For all the successes that I'm able to stand up here and celebrate from the past year, when I look at the number of people that we lost to addiction in 2016, I feel like on that front, we have blatantly failed. We are failing as a community to connect to these people and to help pull them out of the cycle of addiction that is taking their lives in record numbers. Now, to get even a little more personal, I can tell you that for me, there is no worse feeling than being the highest elected official of a city and yet feeling completely helpless in keeping the people of my community from dying from a drug overdose. I take it very seriously and I take it to heart. 
The difficult question that I regularly ask myself and ask my team is what is the mayor's actual role in curbing this drug problem? What does a mayor really do? I look at these numbers and clearly just wanting to help is nowhere near enough. There was a time when if you yourself didn't have a drug problem and neither did anyone in your home, then it just wasn't your problem. But those times are gone, especially with numbers like that. A city our size cannot afford to see numbers like that year after year. We absolutely have to tackle this as an entire community. Addiction is a disease and it needs to be treated that way. We've got to stop dismissing the addicts of our community as a failure and a blight on our city. We've got to help our friends and families with their problems with addiction before it's too late and for many, too late is once they start using drugs. <coughs> need to support the efforts of organizations around Wayne County that are working with addicts and those who are at risk every day to help get their lives back on track. The only way to come close to solving the drug problem is to come together in a network of support and care for these addicts. They are our neighbors and we're losing them. Now on my side, my team and I will work hard to do everything we can within our power to curb this issue. Our police officers and our drug task force work every day to reduce the opportunity for drug dealers to sell illicit substances to the people of our city. <coughs> our officers take time to put together a solid case against these criminals so that when they are arrested, they face lengthy sentences. Now, this process doesn't always happen as fast as we wish it could, but they are working hard and one by one, we will shut down these drug houses. Now, I want to be crystal, crystal clear about something. As a city government, as an administration, as a police force, we are simply not suited to deal with addict support and recovery. However, what we are well suited to deal with is to take a hard stance at removing drugs from our streets. Now, we, not, we may not be able to make everyone choose a different lifestyle. What we can do and what we will do is make it clear that if you sell drugs, Richmond is no longer a place for you to do business. I'm very passionate about that, so I am right now researching the feasibility of hiring additional officers to our department. So I have tasked Richmond Police Department's administration with determining the optimal number of forces or the optimal number of officers to add to our force. Once we've determined that number, we need to make that investment and move in that direction. This is one of the ways that I can positively impact our city's drug problem. Now another way that I can help is to call on all of you, because frankly, I need your help. As mayor, I can encourage and empower you to band together in your neighborhoods to identify and report illegal activities, and even more importantly, to support one another. Over the past several decades, we've been getting away from simply talking to our neighbors. We stay inside, we keep to ourselves, we literally and figuratively build fences and retain from talking to people within our own neighborhoods. There have been numerous studies done on causes that lead down the path to addiction. And though there are many other factors, one common thread is a feeling of isolation. It's time for us as a community to understand that when we go home at the end of the day and shut ourselves in, we are in fact shutting others out. And feeling isolated and not included can be a stepping stone to drug addiction. It is imperative that we breathe new life into our neighborhood associations. Neighborhoods that gather, that communicate, and are vigilant are less likely to have drugs and crime plague their streets. So that's what I'm doing. I'm challenging you to bring your neighborhood together again. Now you have to understand this drug addiction problem that we are facing adheres to no socioeconomic or geographic boundaries. So taking an apathetic, not my problem approach is actually an open door invitation to bring crime and drugs into your neighborhood. So I told you earlier that I want to encourage and empower you, and empower you to take an active role in this fight. So if I'm going to encourage you with this challenge, then I also want to empower you to succeed. So starting April 3rd, I'm going to offer many grants for recognized neighborhoods to come together. I want your neighborhoods to gather, to hold cookouts, to hold block parties, take the time to get to know each other, or if it's better suited to your neighborhood, simply a training session on crime identification and reporting. I'm also, thank you. I'm also asking members of our police department to attend these events 
and help provide training and get to know residents on a more personal level. If your neighborhood is willing to put the work into one of these events, and I hope you will, we will offer up to $500 to help bring your neighborhood together. This is one of the ways that I can help you tackle this issue as a community. And this is how neighborhood by neighborhood, we will begin to take back our streets. Now, the importance of healthy neighborhoods isn't just a matter of battling crime and drugs. And sadly, right now, when the topic of neighborhoods is brought to my office, it is almost always about trash and dumping. For too long, some of our central, oldest, and most beautiful neighborhoods have become cesspools for refuse and junk. There seem to be too many people in this city who think that they can throw their trash wherever they want and no one will notice. I regularly receive emails and pictures of the trash that has been carelessly strewn across our roadways and piles of furniture and debris that clutter our yards and alleys. This constant littering is not just from one-time offenders, but also from habitual offenders who collectively think that their actions go unnoticed and they're not at all deterred by our current fine structure. Well, I've taken that message and their days of littering going unnoticed are over. Our sanitation department works incredibly hard throughout the year to pick up and properly dispose of our trash. Now, it's no secret that our sanitation workers have a pretty dirty job, but they do that job throughout the year with pride and with a diligence to keep this city clean. When I talk to the men and women of our sanitation department, they don't just share with me their wants and needs to more effectively do their jobs. They also share with me their passion for keeping Richmond clean and how exhausted they feel when they see so much excessive littering. They want to see people take a little more ownership in their city and take a little extra effort to pick up after themselves and to keep our alleys and roads free of trash and debris. Every year, it's the sanitation department that spearheads our citywide cleanup. We provide this service as an opportunity for citizens to purge their houses of unwanted materials. But clearly, this has not been enough. So therefore, this year, I'm extending that period an extra week and allowing everyone ample time to get rid of their trash. This year's citywide cleanup will take place from April 22nd to June 2nd. And during that time, I'm calling on each and every one of you to volunteer and help us clean up our city. Now, this is not just an opportunity to rid your home and your yard of unwanted and unsightly trash and debris. This is actually an amnesty period in which we'll make special accommodations to assist you in getting rid of unwanted debris and furniture. After this amnesty period is over, my administration is cracking down on illegal dumping and littered properties. It, <laughs> it is time to take a strong and forceful stance against those who choose to clutter our city. I'm working right now with our law department to not only increase the fines associated with dumping, but to keep a strong grasp on the situation. If the mess is not resolved in a very timely manner, the fine will double. This will send a clear message that dumping will not be tolerated and these issues will no longer fall through the cracks. It is time for Richmond to shine the way it deserves to shine. Now we can't have a conversation about blight, cleanliness, and the safety of our neighborhoods without including a conversation about the deplorable condition of the former hospital site on US 27. Recently, a public meeting was held with Common Council, current and former members of the administration, and a representative of the Indiana Finance Authority. The purpose of this meeting was not only to provide information about the current status of that building, but also to discuss the fate of that site and, to, and the detriment that it poses to this community. This was the latest in a string of meetings among City Council, County Council, the County Commissioners, and my administration. And I can confidently tell you that each of your elected officials is passionate about removing that building for the betterment of this community. We have committed to work as a team to fund the removal of the contaminants inside that building and take the steps towards demolition. Now because of that teamwork, today we can finally show progress. Recently I attended a meeting of County Council's Finance Committee. And during that meeting, they committed to match the city's contribution up to $125,000 for the Contamination Evaluation Plan. This is the plan that will set the stage for remediation and subsequent demolition. We are stronger as a team, so as a cohesive unit, 
we will now be able to more powerfully and effectively reach out to other organizations to help us see this project from here all the way through to completion. Now let me be really crystal clear here. There is not yet a solid timeline to get all of this done. And it's never my intention to overpromise. But what I can assure you is that your team of elected officials is committed to this project and together we are going to bring that old hospital to the ground. <laughs> Removing that eyesore is incredibly important for the obvious safety concern that it poses each and every day. But it's also a boat anchor to our economic success. As the Economic Development Corporation and I bring in potential businesses to Richmond, Having that dilapidated building on one of our main corridors is a major deterrent. As we are on the verge of our next great renaissance, we need to be ready to accept opportunities. We need to capitalize on the short-term wins so that we can leverage long-term wins. Now, everybody knows that we need to work hard on business attraction. We can always use more companies and more jobs. But the most powerful way to capture those companies that are looking to Richmond is to foster an attractive and powerful model to support and facilitate the growth of our current businesses. While we love to see companies that come to our community and bring hundreds of jobs, 80% of the jobs created in Wayne County are created by existing businesses. The companies that are already here are our most precious resource. We're fortunate to have a well-organized and driven economic development corporation. They do a tremendous job of attracting businesses to our community maintaining relationships with existing businesses, and serving as a conduit to, to develop our local workforce. Now, I'm not interested in duplicating the services of our <coughs> EDC. I think they are doing a great job. What I am interested in is working as their partner to empower the work that they do to help our economy thrive. My role is to help define what the businesses of our community need and what the city government can do to support them. Therefore, I am reviving and refocusing the Council on Economic Vitality. This refreshed group will be comprised of business owners, managers, and community leaders, and they will identify points of support for businesses and what the city needs to do to retain them and help them expand. <laughs> this council will work closely with a newly created position in our Department of Infrastructure and Development that will partially serve as a business liaison for the city. Now the first goal for the council will be to support and grow our locally businesses in the very heart of our city and then branch outward. This focus on existing businesses is a piece of what I am calling the big picture. Big is an acronym that stands for business retention and expansion, infrastructure and development, and growth of our population, B-I-G. The Council on Economic Vitality will focus on the B portion of the big picture. The second piece, infrastructure development, is something that our citizens deal with each and every day. Now, these are our streets, our sidewalks, our street lights, and our sanitation and wastewater management systems. When people drive into, into and around Richmond, the very first thing they notice is the condition of our streets. As many of you know, the main corridors into our community are US 40 and US 27 and those are state-operated roads. Now, although we as a city do not have direct jurisdiction over those roads, we frequently lobby to the state to keep them well-maintained and safe for our citizens. When it comes to the streets and roads owned by the city, we're going to use our newly updated roadway inventory and rating system to keep our streets in good condition and improve the ones that need repair. But it's not just about streets, it's also about sidewalks and curbs. For many years, sidewalks were not a top priority. However, when I talk to residents, when I walk <coughs> through neighborhoods, I see too many walkways that pose a trip and safety hazard to our pedestrians. So starting now, we'll be using a sidewalk rating and tracking system to identify areas in need of repair. We'll utilize this system to make two long overdue guarantees to this community. One is to utilize this system to begin fixing trip hazards right now, and two, is to continue that work to remove all trip hazards over two inches in the next five years. This is our commitment to infrastructure and this is our commitment to your safety. Having an infrastructure system that works for our local businesses, is friendly for our visitors and safe for our citizens may seem like a luxury for good economic times, but in reality, 
It's the responsibility of your local government and should always be a pressing topic. The third piece of the big picture is the growth of our population. Richmond has seen a decline in our population since the 1970s. We've seen people leave us as big factories and businesses have shut down due to economic factors. We've seen them move away as larger cities have become more attractive. And we've seen our bright youth become educated and then find work and life elsewhere. This outmigration needs to stop. It is time for Richmond to be the kind of city that retains its citizens and is attractive to people looking for a new home. Now, as we work on attracting people to our city, it's vital that we are connecting our population to workforce development resources. We are so fortunate to have Richmond Adult Education, the Excel Center, the NACCO Empowerment Community Center, Work One in their Golden Ticket Program. We have Manufacturing Matters. We have the Indiana Vocational Rehabilitation Services and many more resources all aimed at navigating those who want better employment into gainful employment. Highlighting the work that these organizations do and working to connect them with those in our community that can benefit from their services will go a very long way in bridging the employment gap in our community. Now as we talk about the growth of our population, people will choose a city that is focusing on so many of the topics we've covered tonight. They'll choose a city that is welcoming, that is safe, that has good economic opportunities, that invests in its infrastructure and offers amenities, parks, and culture. A city where they can live, work, play, and grow. Richmond is a city with all of those opportunities. Our job is simply to market those opportunities so that people know who we are, where we are, and what it is we have to offer. Business retention expansion, infrastructure development, and growing our population. This is the big picture, and this is how we'll be measured by people considering Richmond as their next home. When I look at what Richmond has to offer, I honestly fall in love with this city over and over and over again. We have the Richmond Symphony Orchestra, the Community Orchestra, a thriving theater and art museum, a history museum, a car museum, a natural history and science museum, we have 19 beautiful and thriving parks that host multiple family fun events during every season of the year. We have four undergrad institutions whose students breathe life and knowledge into our community. Our nightlife is strong and growing with locally owned and operated wineries and craft breweries. And our downtown and depot districts are seeing a resurgence with businesses and shops and frankly, some of the best food and coffee I've ever had in my life. <laughs> We have all of this built on a rich history of industry, philanthropy, community, and music. When we talk about the things that Richmond has to offer. It is so easy to see why we all call this place home. Now, every day I'm surrounded by people, both at meetings and at social gatherings, who are really committed to making Richmond an even better place for all of us. And I'm really passionate about doing my part. I'm dedicated to be a partner to everyone who wants to see Richmond grow to its full potential. However, there is something that I have come to realize. There is no way that a mayor or any number of elected officials can ever do this on their own. I know that Richmond has its share of, its pro of problems, but our problems are not much different than what other cities across the state and the country face. I get really frustrated when I hear people say that our problems are what set us apart. When I sit in my office every day, I see a city that is set apart not by the problems, but by the solutions and opportunities to fix what is wrong. We can lay out a long list of cities that face problems similar to ours. That's easy. But I can't tell you a single other city that has the people, the passion, and the resources to find solutions to these problems the way we do. That is what sets us apart, and that's what makes us special. Now, I've told you many times tonight over and over again that I need your help and that you play a vital role in our city's success. So before I close tonight, I have one more task for you, one more challenge. I'm not going to lie, this one is not going to be easy. However, it is one of the most important. Day after day, we see and hear people who spend their time magnifying the negativity that goes on in this city. We all see it. The truth manipulated in every tiny crack made out to be a grand canyon that keeps us from anything positive. Those people have created a platform of negativity from which they broadcast their message every day. 
And make no mistake, as we talk about the marketing of this city and sharing the narrative of who we are, that too is part of the story. And too often that negative message ends up taking center stage. And even more depressing is when I tell people to overpower that negativity with a more positive message, they tell me that it's too tiring. The negativity seems insurmountable or it's not worth arguing over. We've talked tonight about so many of the wins and so many of the things that make our city special. We've talked about thoughtful budgeting that invest in our city services, a thriving economy, safe streets, and quality of life, and all of these are essential to the success of our city. But the thread that holds that entire quilt together is the narrative of our community. That's the story of who we are. And too often when that narrative is shared, it's the naysayers who shout the loudest and the rest of us are drowned out. Tonight, I'm calling on all of you to stop dismissing that negativity and allowing it to dictate the message of who we are. Now look, they've built their mountain of negativity and they have their take on this city. And we are so blessed to live in a country where free speech should never be impeded. So let them have it. We don't need it. We need to build a bigger mountain of positivity and hope. And when we do that as a whole and as a community, we will dictate the narrative and the story of who we really are will take center stage and we'll be unstoppable as a city. And more importantly, you the citizens of Richmond will lay the foundation for future generations of positive leadership to take the helm and move us forward. Now don't think for one second that anything that I've talked about tonight doesn't involve you. As your mayor, I am simply here to serve you and everything I do is based on you. So I ask you tonight to play an active role, stay connected, get engaged, but most importantly, stand up for your city, work hard, and always fight for Richmond. Thank you so much for listening and good night. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Mayor Snow. For those of you that are here, the mayor will be in the lobby outside Whitewater Community Television to answer your questions or to talk to you. But for the community watching, I want to remind you that if your not-for-profit organization has an event that you would like to put on our community calendar, all you have to do is get it to us at least two weeks in advance to WCTV at IUE.edu. Just mail us your flyer. We'll get that information up for your not-for-profit organization. There is no cost to do that, and we are happy to do that for you. I want to remind you about a couple of things. If you are uh, watching your television, don't go away from Whitewater Community Television channels. Tonight at 8 o'clock is the first episode of Read Beside You being hosted by Sherry Harlan. It is a brand new show being put on by Read Health. It will be airing every Thursday night beginning at 8 o'clock on WETV Channel 20. Let's Talk is a series that started a few years ago by the School of Humanities and Social Sciences. It tackles health issues around the, uh, that affect our area. And this Tuesday night, we have another live broadcast here from the WCTV studios from 7 till 8. Angie Cooksey, senior lecturer here at IU East, is going to be hosting Bob Reynolds, Diane Bailey, and Heather Riggs from Reed Health. The topic this year is cancer. This will be the second live show. They do take your questions or comments during the program, and that too will be on WETV Channel 20 again from 7 to 8 on Tuesday evening. I want to remind you again, next Thursday's In Focus is going to focus on road construction. We'll have Nathan Riggs from NDOT, Bob Warner, Wayne County Engineer, and Greg Steen, City Engineer, talking about um, some of the construction that's going to be going on in and around Wayne County. That show, as always, with In Focus begins at 6 p.m., and we will take your questions for our guests. As I mentioned at the top of the show, our fourth annual fundraiser, 21 for Fun, is going to be taking place on June 17th. Save that date on your calendar. Ticket information will be coming out very soon. If you missed any of the mayor's speech, I want to remind you that as with all of our In Focus programs, it will be available for broadcast on WGTV Channel 11 beginning at 1030 tonight. Replays also tomorrow night at 8, Saturday at 8 a.m. and 9 p.m. and Sunday at 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. It's also available on WGTV Online, our video on demand site, which you can reach through our website, wctv.info.
Normally we go a full hour for In Focus, but this one was dedicated to the mayor's State of the City address, so we're going to end a little early this evening. Thank you very much for watching In Focus. We'll see you next Thursday evening at 6 o'clock here on WGTV Channel 11. Have a good night. Hi, I'm Sherry Harlan, program host for Read Beside You. Join me on our next show with our guest, Kathy Roberts and Beth Overmeyer from ClaimAid, and Tawan Stoker, Director of Wellness from Read Health. You can watch Read Beside You on Thursdays at 8 p.m. on WETV Channel 20. You are watching Whitewater Government Television, Channel 11.